can justice be saved? That's the theme of the talks which I will undertake uh, over the next three nights. Can justice be saved? The question invites a host of others, each more bracing than the last. Can justice be saved from whom or from what? Should we allow a shadow to be cast over justice, as the question does, by presuming it might be insufficient for the world around us? Is not justice the tonic the world needs? And perhaps most difficult of all, which justice? This question, as you all well know, is the theme of Plato's Republic. My encounter with that text here at Tory Honors many years ago made me a Christian. In his attempt to rescue justice from Thrasymachus' assertion that it is the power of the strong over the weak, Plato discovered that the more fundamental question is whether we can be saved rather than justice. To this, he had no real answer. The world would wait some 400 years, I think, for that. Justice is still in need of saving here in our decadent late modern society as it is in every generation. Asking about what we owe to one another takes us to the foundation of our lives together as human beings. Whether we should pursue such fundamental questions though itself calls into question the nature and content of justice. To give the question of justice its due requires time and attention. Time that we might not seem to have when people around us are suffering. At the outset of the Second World War, C.S. Lewis acknowledged the urgency of the crisis that had gripped the world, but still exhorted his students to carry on their studies. If men had proposed the search for knowledge and beauty, uh, if men had proposed the search for knowledge and beauty until they were secure, he wrote, the search would never have begun. We might say the same about our inquiries into justice in the midst of a culture war, or among poverty, or when we are surrounded by the vast range of injustices clamoring for our attention. But such entanglement in the world and its injustices is indispensable for thinking about our theme in these lectures. The question of justice is both motivated by and informed by our practical awareness of our neighbor's needs, or at least our awareness of what their needs seem to be. Learning the truth of, their matter, of the matter is a task for which moral reflection and analysis is required. What we owe to one another is not always as transparent as we might like justice to be. But from whom or what might justice need saving? Tonight and in the nights following, I hope to say something substantive about what justice demands. But I hope to do so in a way that illuminates the world around us and helps us discern our responsibilities as Christians. If the question of what justice demands is abstract and perennial, the contours of any inquiry into it will be bound both by history and the context in which we stand as it was for Plato, Socrates and his very many interlocutors who have followed him. Any sketch of those threats to justice in our own time will be tendentious, yet to discern where our responsibilities lie, such a sketch must be made. So here you are. In recent years, American society has been gripped by a political urgency that has suffocated the possibility of finding common ground or compromise. Such an atmosphere emanates, I think, from a post-Christian sense of despair that has seized both sides of our culture wars. Neither conservatives nor progressives have much interest in the patience and long-suffering required to secure a peace wherein all Americans might live as one people. The post-Christian quality of the conservative right is perhaps harder to detect because it has so often been cloaked, cloaked its hopelessness in the name of Jesus Christ. Political evangelicals, and the quotes are deliberate, political evangelicals 
were not the first to use grievance and victimhood for political gain, but they have learned those arts well. After being marginalized from many of America's institutions of power, Hollywood, big business, the media, and even the Republican Party, conservative evangelicals embraced a renegade president who would at last defend their interests. Having long given up any hope of persuading the other side, it did not matter that our president's racial and sexual attitudes seemed to prove the religious rights critics right. The chance of curtailing abortion rights and the urgency of saving the white working class from self-destruction made any social, social costs well worth the gains. Who has time to build consensus when infants are being killed and the white working class is killing itself? This despair, though, animates our progressive left as well. The comprehensive, the comprehensive vision of equality for every social group cannot brook dissent. The movement to liberate marginalized identities has been replaced by an effort to coercively extinguish alternate views. Such hostility is founded upon the notion that ideas are not only the root of oppression, but that allowing them to be stated publicly is intrinsically damaging. As New York Times columnist Ross Douthat put it recently, Protestant awakenings have given way to post-Protestant wokeness. Politically, Democrats have reacted to Republicans by radicalizing their commitment to this vision of symbolic and social equality, as they have their defense of abortion. On gay rights, for instance, defending the freedom of individuals to marry has transformed into suppressing religiously-based objections to it. Not surprisingly, the argument against traditional sexual ethics has shifted as well where critics once argued that such views are false or wrong, they now propose traditional views literally kill people. Who has time for tolerance when there is blood on Christians' hands? Within a political atmosphere dominated by resentment and despair, one might hope to turn to those marked by the gospel to find an account of justice that could be good news for American society. Yet from that corner, we discover a theological challenge to justice which threatens to imperil it rather than save it. For many conservative evangelicals, allowing the pursuit of justice to be central to or constitutive of the church's vocation vitiates her unique responsibility to announce the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I understand their worries, such conservative evangelicals think agitating for social justice diminishes the centrality of evangelism for social transformation and downplays the importance of personal responsibility in the pursuit of systemic institutional change. The Christian should act justly, they say, but the church has no obligation to pursue social justice, as doing so would violate its divinely ordained limits. This carries with it the corollary that a just society arises only from the widespread conversion of individuals to Jesus Christ. Justice needs saving on this account, but it needs saving from being confused with the gospel. Justice is an implication of the gospel rather than central to or constitutive of it. Besides these theological concerns, conservative evangelical anxieties about social justice also have an empirical and generational edge. To speak of social justice rather than biblical justice means one is aiding and abetting the progressive ethos of despair. Social justice can only be understood through the history from which it emerged and through the uses to which it is and has been put. On this account, social justice demands the symbolic and economic equality, which when deployed by critical race theorists and cultural Marxists, uses the logic of victimhood, identity, and power to advance sub or anti-biblical moral stances. The term social justice has its own content, 
in other words, and any attempt to infuse it with the Bible's own moral logic or grammar can only be capitulation to hostile anti-Christian principalities and powers. Augustine and the early Christians sought to plunder the spoils of Egypt by announcing the good news of Jesus Christ in the political and philosophical vocabulary of their time. But younger, woke Christians, we are told, cannot be trusted to discern between the spoils of social justice and those which will simply spoil us. What should we make of all this? How might justice be saved? Conservative evangelical critics of the term are right about this much. The question of justice's scope and content can only be answered when we grasp the significance of God's revelation in Jesus Christ for the society in which we live. But if we start at this point, it seems as though we must speak of charity and not justice. Jesus distills the law and prophets into the in, into the twofold injunction to love God and our neighbor. The second command to love our neighbor is like unto the command to love God. The two commands are distinct but inseparable, as the two natures of Christ are distinct but inseparable. The two commands content is thus governed by the love of Jesus Christ. A new commandment I give unto you, Jesus tells his disciples, that they love one another even as he has loved them. Paul also emphasizes, unsurprisingly, the preeminence of charity for the moral life, an indication that his ethics are not so different from Jesus's after all. Own no man anything, he writes to the Romans, save to love one another, for he that loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Even more famously, Paul condenses the Christian moral witness into the three theological virtues. Now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is charity. Yet the New Testament's concentrated focus on faith, hope, and love preserves the Old Testament's interest it in the just ordering of society, rather than eradicates it. The fulfillment of the law by Christ does not abolish it, but transfigures it. The Old Testament knows of faith, hope, and love, but it cannot speak of them with the definitiveness or clarity that comes from the advent of the Messiah. The New Testament's crystallization of what God demands of the world includes all that comes before it. Salvation is from the Jews. We have heard from the beginning that we should love one another, 1 John tells us. The twofold command to love God and our neighbor summarizes both the law and the prophets, each of which are intensely interested in justice both in Israel and beyond. God hath shown thee, O man, what is good, Micah writes. The address is not only to Israel, but to the undifferentiated Adam of Genesis 1, the original of humanity. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Faith, hope, and love. Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. The juxtaposition of Paul and Micah's triadic formulas might help us learn to speak Christianly about justice in our time. The first names virtues, and the second practices. The one looks backward to Christ's atonement and the other forward. As there is no Christ without the witness of the two testaments that surround him, so there is no justice without faith, no mercy without hope, and no humility without charity. John's complementary triad of the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life names 
the threats to these virtuous practices, which seek to prevent the gospel from shining forth in clarity and grace. Faith and justice must look beyond themselves. They are each necessary, but incomplete. But their unity with the other members of their respective triads means that if we reject one, they all fall. A world without faith can have no hope or love. A world that spurns mercy and humility will soon see justice depart. Only by holding together these triads can justice be saved. In this way, justice must be saved or it shall be no longer just. What then, to pick up the theme for the first talk, might faith have to do with justice? In the first place, faith means justice is a matter of rightly responding to God's redemption, which binds us to God's good creation and requires us to conform our lives to the order within it. The Lord's rebuke of Israel in Micah 6, 1 through 8 is instructive in this regard. Injustice has triumphed in Israel because she ungratefully scorned God's grace in bringing her out of Egypt. Yet when Israel rejects God's redemption, creation stands in judgment. It is to the mountains that God makes his complaint against his people. Hear you mountains, the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, for the Lord has an indictment against Israel. The mountains precede Israel in God's economy, and so they bear perpetual witness to God's gracious kindness despite Israel's transgressions. No wonder God addresses the Adam, Adam in naming humanity's moral responsibilities in the same passage. The demand for justice is written into the creation itself. It extends as far as the east is from the west. If we fail to live as God's creatures, creation itself will bear witness against our vanity. We need not look long into the New Testament to see that this is so. If the people do not praise God, the very stones will rise up and do so instead. The cosmic groaning of creation is matched by our groaning in prayer as we order our lives toward what shall finally liberate us both, namely the redemption of our bodies. There is no faith and no justice that does not honor the authority of the Lord Jesus over every inch of his created world, Justice is both responsive and responsible to the, ver to the content of the very good that God uttered when creation was complete. Second, faith puts an end to the voracious demand for sacrifice that arises when we attempt to cleanse our sin by our own hands. The kindness of God leads humanity to repentance. It awakens both a godly sorrow for our wrongdoing and a glad eagerness to set matters right with our neighbor. We are to leave our offerings upon the altar, Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, and make haste in reconciling ourselves to one another. Yet it is impossible to make full restitution or compensation for wrongs. The peace we have with one another depends upon both parties recognizing this limit. Sin is nearly infinite. The only final and definitive remedy for injustice is the forgiving grace of the infinite God. No punishment, no damages, no consolation can rectify the murder of Abel. His blood cries up from the ground in response to Cain's sin. Sin takes time, both from the sinner and their victim. A person might repay the money they have stolen, but they cannot give back the time their victim loses in seeking justice and peace. The sacrifice of the infinite God is the world's only hope for real restitution. In the resurrection, the slain lamb, Jesus Christ, gives back to us all the time we have lost to sin and more besides. 
we shall soon find ourselves, though, sacrificing more innocent blood if we join with Lady Macbeth in trying to wash the indelible blood of guilt from our own hands. Israel responds to God's accusation in Micah by offering a litany of sacrifices, each more extreme, until they propose joining with the pagans in slaughtering their firstborns to satisfy the demand of justice. Where sin unmakes the world, justice demands the mercy of God. Any attempt to restore the world on other terms can only ultimately breed new wrongs. Yet if the gospel saves justice from itself, it also liberates justice to be itself. The imperative to do justly follows the two dimensions articulated above. It has something to say about the needs we have by virtue of being creatures in God's image and about our guilt and innocence. On the one side, justice demands recognizing the humanity and creatureliness of our neighbor and bestowing upon them what is necessary for their security and their beatitude. We are bound together within the covenant of creation. Our recognition of the fellowship we have as humans grounds the mutual obligations we have toward one another. For one to have resources in abundance and another to starve is a disordered response to the sanctity of our neighbor, whose needs as a creature made in God's image make a claim upon our action. How rectitude is secured in such cases is an important question, but our neighbor is owed what he needs to flourish, even if he opts to use it for vice. On the other side, justice secures a partial and limited judgment upon those who do wrong. It protects the innocent and takes agency and time from those who would rob them from others. Yet when the institutions of justice are founded upon the sufficiency and finality of the death of the one innocent, Jesus Christ, justice issues its judgment only upon the wrongdoer. The operations of justice demand an absolute prohibition upon destroying innocent lives within the pursuit of justice itself. The presumption of innocence in our legal system is founded upon this theological principle. The death of the one innocent for all means that in securing redress for victims, a justice system must not create new ones. The weakening of this presumption in our society is, I think, one of the clearest indications we are a post-Christian society that I know of. Such a sketch of justice's content makes it, I think, something more than an implication of the gospel. Without the gospel, justice sanctions injustice. But justice is a necessary condition of how we recognize the gospel's truth and power. The gospel reaches out into the world, altering its character and transforming relations between neighbors. To what shall I compare the kingdom of God, Jesus asks in Luke. It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in the garden. It grew and became a tree, and birds perched in its branches. The kingdom is a source of life and beatitude, not only for those inside it, but for those beyond. The world really can come to the church and ask for direction, just as the rich young ruler came to Jesus and asked what he must, must do to be saved. The church answers this question by looking directly at the gospel and its content rather than its implications. If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Jesus' practical directive is simply the good news of his abundant life transposed into an imperatival key. The commands of God are a distinct mode of his grace and are inseparable from the indicatives which name his action. The Christian life is one of grateful conformity to God's own life, that we may live with God 
is inseparable from the equally good news that we must do so. The exhortation to do justly is central to the church's life then, because the church can only be the church if she follows her Savior in living and dying for the world. Having been set free from our debts and trespasses, we really are free. But freedom is not for our comfort and complacency, but for following our Savior in being poured out as a drink offering for those in need. In the church, yes, but also outside of it. Our ministry to the world is not a second sacrifice. It is a glad witness to Christ's irrepeatable sacrifice. The church is not of the world. It has its origin in, and life in Jesus Christ. But as the church lives in Jesus Christ, it lives for the world as Christ does. It lives for the world's renewal and repentance, and also for its justice and its peace. Jesus healed bodies in his earthly ministry, announcing in those works an authority over sin and death that would only become finally transparent on Easter Sunday. The new creation affirms and restores what is given us in creation. And by living within the dawning of this new time, the church announces the good news of Christ's triumph over death by participating in his ongoing care for the suffering and destruction of bodies. In loving our neighbor as Christ has loved us, the church points the world toward the renewed covenant of creation that binds us all together as humans made in his image. By submitting herself to the judgment of God, the church is granted the limited, but very real authority to name injustices and ameliorate the suffering she sees in the world and to accompany those who are attempting to do likewise. What, though, of social justice? Establishing rectitude between individuals is one matter. Addressing the lingering effects of wrongdoing is quite another. There is a kind of individualism which is Christianity's gift to the world. We are not wholly or simply bundles of people who are determined by the institutions that form us. The person who is made in God's image is radically unique. He can only live his own life and may not live another. We are told in the Sermon the on the mount to enter into our closet and pray in secret, alone by ourselves before the face of God. The gospel forgives an individual's acts, choices, desires, and intentions, all of which the individual does and which no one else does for them. The individual must be regenerated to enter the kingdom of God. They really must be born again. But born again from what? We come from somewhere into the Christian life, and the marks we bear from those places do not quickly leave us. Grace is more comprehensive than sin, which is good news, because sin can structure our attitudes and thoughts even outside or beneath our conscious choices or intentions. Our lives are intertwined with the communities we live in, which means the transgressions of others are in an important way our own. Isaiah is a man of unclean lips, and he lives among a people of unclean lips, he says when he sees the Lord. The latter confession is necessary for true repentance. The principalities and powers infiltrate our imaginations without us realizing it, where they live on within our hearts until God's gracious holiness wakes us to their presence. When at last we see God face to face, we shall know the one who knows us fully already. And in knowing him, we shall at last see the hidden and invisible depths of our own hearts. We need not bother ourselves with total depravity at this point. Acknowledging our actual depravity is more than enough. We absorb morals the way we do our atmosphere. 
toxins enter our bloodstream, destroying our life without us being aware of what we're missing. A little leaven leavens the whole loaf, Paul writes to the Corinthians, and it does so without the loaf realizing what's afoot. Yet there are crucial differences between the moral ecosystems in which we live and the moral choices that we make. The leaven that leavens the whole loaf gets there somehow. Bad morals infiltrate our communities when authorities fail to enact discipline appropriately, allowing the leaven to spread. Yet if failing to expunge an evil is bad, directly and intentionally choosing it is worse. Aren't you glad you came tonight? That little gem was for free. <laughs> we are more responsible for what we knowingly will and intentionally choose than we are for what we unintentionally inflict. Paradoxically though, defending the uniqueness of personal responsibility this way explains why justice must be social if it's to be just at all. The corporate, systemic, and even transgenerational quality of justice arises from the astonishing weight and scope of individual choices. Like a note of music that lives on in the atmosphere, an individual's moral choice never dies. It abides in their character and within the institution it shapes until it is named, confessed, and repented of by them and the community that has organized its life around that choice. Moral choices have a surplus that endures beyond the particular act itself. The Lord visits the sins, visits sins upon the third and fourth generations because he has to. Sin shapes a moral environment at least that long. For this reason, Leviticus clearly indicates, he says outright, that we are to confess our own sins and the sins of our forefathers. The gospel then sets us free from our past, not by liberating us from our communities, but by empowering us to act within and for them to pursue systemic justice, we might say, by naming and acknowledging our sins as we become alive to them through the gracious kindness of God. This way of thinking about justice borrows the imagery the New Testament uses to speak about evangelism, which it depicts as a corporate activity carried out over time by multiple people. One man plants, another waters, but it is the Lord who gives the increase. In evangelizing, we reap what we did not work for. We gather fruit that grew out of the choices others made. The one who sows and the one who reaps rejoice together because they are both implicated in a person's conversion. There is a surplus to the concrete action of planting a seed. Its significance can only be known much later. In the same way, Individual choices plant the seeds of justice within institutions, allowing later generations to enjoy their fruits. There is no good to be done for the kingdom by an individual just as such. We act as persons who are formed by and who represent communities in our action. The fruit of the Christian life is inherently systematic. Consider, in this light, the institution of marriage, which is perhaps the clearest example of how justice must be both social and transgenerational. The marriage vow is the natural training ground for faith in the gospel. The faith required to live within the covenant of marriage imposes mutual obligations on spouses. It trains us to do justly to our nearest neighbor and forges trustworthiness and fidelity within our character. Yet the justice within this marriage bond is also multi-generational 
marriage is quite literally the wellspring of new life. By forging individuals in fidelity and trustworthiness, marriage is an institution that secures justice for children by ensuring they receive the love they are owed and are free to cultivate their capacities as persons. The state has a responsibility to secure justice for children invested as it is in protecting innocents from becoming victims of their parents' irresponsibility and vice. The state's relationship to marriage then is both symbolic and directive. It guides individual actions by incentivizing or de-incentivizing particular choices and by sending corresponding messages about what it values. Seeing marriage as a multi-generational institution, though, means it precedes individuals and their moral choices. As children, the moral atmosphere embodied within a marriage forms our imaginations in ways that we do not realize until we get married. Marriage establishes a feedback loop. A failed marriage becomes self-perpetuating as it radically disrupts the moral environment in which a child is raised, not to mention the economic and social environments as well. The effects of divorce can quite literally be traced to the third or fourth generation. Social capital begins at home. There is no social justice if children are not given their due, namely, the loving presence of a mother and father. This feedback loop, though, reaches beyond the choices of individual couples. The norms a society and its government inscribe about marriage determine what choices individuals can and will make. A society that de-incentivizes marriage, socially and economically, for instance, makes it harder for any particular individual to marry, no matter how noble their intentions, as many of you might discover when you leave Biola. All this, I think, is not very good news for us here today. The institution of marriage has been eviscerated by our society's embrace of the lust of the flesh, which is the tyrannical pursuit of pleasure without concern for the future. Not surprisingly, given the themes I have developed, the injustices we have embraced in sex and marriage have left only cynicism and mistrust in their wake. The lust of the flesh has destroyed faith and invigorated the post-Christian despair I described above. We do not trust the explicit covenants we make in marriage vows for some good reason. But then, if we don't trust these explicit vows, how can we trust the tacit, invisible covenants of humanity that bind us together as people? If we cannot have faith in what we can see, in the marriages and the weddings that are happening before us. How shall we believe in what we cannot see? The gospel has something to say, I think, to the injustices being perpetuated within our current understanding of marriage. The grace of God turns the hearts of children to their fathers and vice versa. By sweeping the family into the grammar of the church, the gospel simultaneously relativizes natural family bonds and reveals their true basis and foundation. Laws and policies that fail to conform with this reality as much as they can, such as those that would sanction no-fault divorce or same-sex marriage, impair our ability to hear the grace of God in marriage as good news. The fruit of such policies will only be known long after they are implemented. Leaven rarely works quickly. But no institution is so morally potent in the formation of a person's life than this one. If the gospel awakens a current concern for justice, it does so preeminently, though not solely, with respect to marriage and family. Now, 
It is perhaps uncommon to hear marriage spoken of in the context of the gospel's relationship to justice. Yet the manner of reasoning upon which traditional Christians have resisted the decline of America's marriage, college, excuse me, America's marriage culture is entirely consistent with what advocates of social justice have sought to defend on matters of economics, race, and the like. It's the same patterns of reasoning in both cases. If marriage is a transgenerational institution, so is our housing market. Setting prices or issuing credit on the basis of race, as has happened in American society, is an injustice that lasts into subsequent generations. The individuals who make such choices doubtlessly bear the greater responsibility. But behold, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Speaking about personal responsibility without recognizing the ambivalent character, if not outright unjust character, of the world we inherit inclines us to be more punitive with one another than we ought be, as it ignores that we come into this world from somewhere, that the world is made before we are able to exercise any personal responsibility at all. The gospel sets us free from past injustices, but it only does so when we face up to this history and renounce all Satan's works, past and present, in confession. There can be no fundamental conservatism for the Christian. You have no idea how much it pains me to say that. The goods we have received from the past are not so unalloyed that they can be trusted indiscriminately. As T.S. Eliot wrote, who was, if anyone was, a great Christian conservative. The church cannot be in any political sense either conservative or liberal or revolutionary. Conservatism is too often conservation of the wrong things. Liberalism, a relaxation of discipline. Revolution, a denial of the permanent things. If the church is to respond to social justice then, it must acknowledge that the people demanding it come from somewhere. Conservative evangelicals are right. The concept of social justice has come to us today not direct from heaven. It came from somewhere, and it has its own content. It can only be extricated from that context with great care. But the social inequalities and arrangements about which there is such grave controversy in our society also came from somewhere and come from a place that is at best as ambivalent as the context out of which the concept of social justice arose. We cannot pretend otherwise. Our responsibility to one another is inherently shaped and determined by the places we both came from. If we ignore this history, we risk falling prey to unwittingly perpetuating those unjust arrangements by failing to seek reconciliation. The cry for justice, in conclusion, arises from those who feel alienated from institutions God ordained for their flourishing. But to answer this cry, we must look beyond justice lest we give ourselves over to the voracious, infinite demand for retribution. When we forgo the justice of God, which has secured forgiveness for those who repent, we shall soon demand the sacrifice of new innocent blood. For justice to be good news, the church must learn to walk with those communities who are scorned and disenfranchised, either in our own time or in the past. For when God's children cry out in the streets, the church, the, the church should be prepared to respond not with stones, but with the bread of humility and of a hope that issues justice for the victim, even when offering mercy to the debtor. Justice demands no less if it is to be saved. Thanks.
Yeah, so if I understand the question, it's something like, there's an asymmetry or a difference between how the world has responded to the despair among the white working class versus the despair that, say, black Americans have felt um, within their, uh, their particular experience. Um, yeah, I think that's really fair to, to, to acknowledge and to worry about. Um, the, I am not at all the person to comment on uh, the history and experience of black Americans. Um, I can only say that uh, I play basketball at my local park uh, uh, several times a week, and it's been one of the most interesting experiences of my life, and I don't do it for any other reason than it's the nearest court to me, and I like to save my time uh, by not driving too far. Uh, and I play with a lot of young men who are um, African Americans who are lower class and a lot of young men who are white working class as well. Uh, and it's been fascinating to see many of the similarities between their respective experiences, but also some of the crucial differences. Uh, I, I first became alive to this when a very young boy that I was playing with, uh, 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 probably eight or nine, noticed the police car across the way and started talking about whether or not the cop was going to come over, which is not something I'd ever thought to do, um, right? So the sense of despair within the black community right now seems to be very palpable. Uh, I mean, Tennessee Coates, to pick a person who has shaped discourse within African American culture, uh, political culture, and our, you know, just political culture more broadly on these issues, is totally despairing, it seems. Uh, and there's actually some people who, it, one of the things that I'll raise in my last talk is whether or not hope is a vice. Because there are certain ways in which you can look at hope and say, well, look, you're just sanctioning. You're just allowing these unjust conditions to endure. Really what you need to do is have some hope. Buck up. Be cheerful, right? And that doesn't seem right. So I think you're right that there is an asymmetry of response there, and I have no doubt that that's um, probably partially driven by um, a sense of weariness or a sense of like familiarity to certain claims of injustice from the black community and the novelty of the white working class phenomenon. I mean, the, the, the opioid crisis is an extraordinary crisis in that it's sanctioned, and this may be different than the black experience of drugs, the opioid cri crisis is partially built out of decisions that pharmaceutical companies made that were deeply unjust, right, to promulgate certain drugs in these particular ways. And so it seems to have actually a corporate sanctioning or a corporate backing to the opioid crisis that makes it in one sense, I think, complicated or uh, in a way that what happened in the black community may have gone a little bit differently. I don't know that that's the case, but that's one intuition, right? There's a kind of novelty here that, that gives our attention. And it's just so striking, the death levels, right? For the first time, uh, the, so for the third year in a row, we just saw today, uh, life expectancy in the United States has dropped for the third year in a row. And, and the, the major contributor to that is basically the white working class killing themselves. And so that's not a real answer to your question, Jason, but it's some, we, sh we need to talk a lot more about that. And I want to hear what you have to say, too. Um, other questions? Yeah, go. Yeah, good question. So the question is, have I done any work on the institutions of marriage outside of the US compared to those inside? No, not particularly. Um, my, my concerns or my, my research on marriage is largely philosophically driven, not empirically. So I wouldn't comment on you know, other, other cases. Sorry. Try to know my limits. Yeah, right. People who know me just know that's a total lie. I don't try to know. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, yeah, you should just say that, Paul. Yeah, go. Um, how does that make a difference? Yeah, good. And this, I think this is a terrific question. What does it look like for me to confess the sins of those who came before me, and what difference does it make? Um, 
I think confession, we should understand very broadly, right? We should understand it in the way that Augustine writes his confessions. There's a lot going on there that isn't just, look, I did this act. I stole some pears, and let me, like, just say, hey, world, stole some pears, right? Um, I did that, and oh, look, now I'm forgiven, and we're done with it, right? What Augustine does in confessions is undertake this uh, laborious exploration of the sources and causes of this act within his own life, right? Like he, and it, to the point that it can, in the hands of a 19-year-old, become mildly self-indulgent to perhaps to the point of narcissistic, um, and maybe in the hands of a 40-year-old too, right? Um, but this, this, this expansive, rigorous sense of trying to understand the etiology of things, where things come from, and naming where they come from, how they, uh, how we sort of ended up where we are, as a part of helping us move forward, right? If the past shapes today, if it really has, you cannot understand the contours of today without knowing where we come from, right? You're just gonna, you don't wake up one day in the world and like, it's all new that day. And so I think the work of history and thinking historically is a kind of confession, right? It's a naming of what has gone on in the past with hon honesty, with charity, with a recognition that people are complicated and with an appreciation for the possibility of moral complicity in bad things even by otherwise good people. Right? And studying history with an eye to that teaches us about our own complicity in bad things un unknowingly and unintentionally. Right? Like, I think there are lots of ways in which our society is wildly complicit in the destruction of embryos. Right? If you want to talk about like institutions of injustice in America, I could go on at length about the fertility industry which we speak of as an industry, right? And there are lots of ways in which many churches are fully complicit in that without any acknowledgement of what's going on, in part because they are not aware of and alive to the history of the development of that industry in America and the ways in which their own lives are entangled within it. And so the work of confessing what came in the past, I think, is partially just a work of telling history, of relaying those stories to one another and acknowledging the, the truth about the ambivalence of our world and how we got here. What's the value of that? I think that, um, I really think it sets us free. Uh, there's a way of doing it which is actually really problematic, right? The weight of history is really heavy, right? Like it's a lot to bear all of those choices. But the good news of the gospel is that we are set free not only from our past, but from the whole past. And that freedom is one not to forget, but to tell the truth about it. And that difference I think is really crucial, right? Um, so I think there is a deep therapeutic value within a community about telling its own history uh, fully and honestly and truthfully. Um, and it's one that allows us to discern, I think, what our responsibilities are in light of the past. Because we have them, right? I will, as a son, be responsible for certain choices that my parents make, right? There's such a thing as filial obligations. I'm responsible to uh, manage their estate, for instance, to, uh, 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 to conduct their final choices in the way that they had wanted. Their choices obligate me to things that I never chose, right? I didn't, I didn't decide that, I didn't choose that, and that's just how we live in the world. Sorry, that's not a very good answer, but um, that's a start. We should argue more about that. Other questions? I'll keep going all night. The punish, yeah, this is something that I am really concerned about, right? The weakening of the presumption of innocence 
hasn't yet reached like case law or anything like that. It still abides there. But it is absolutely the case in our social conversations about um, uh, sexual abuse, for instance, right? There is a, uh, a sense that we should not presume the innocence of those who are accused. And there are important differences between what happens in a social conversation and what happens in the courts of law that, that I think have to be noted. But I worry that the social conversation will weaken the presumption in courtrooms among juries, right? So why do I think the presumption of innocence is an explicitly Christian idea? Um, because I'm a theologian, <laughs> Matthew. Um, uh, in part because I, I think the, the problem of rectifying wrongs is an underappreciated problem. And the, the, uh, uh, maybe I'll say that differently. The infinitude of wrongs I think is a real problem. Right? That, these, that when I wrong someone, I create a condition that in one sense means they can never be made whole. Because they lose time. If you are a victim, you lose so much time. Right? You are taken away from doing so much good in this world by virtue of having to wrestle with the institutions of justice to make yourself partially whole but you will never get back all of that time. It cannot happen. And from that standpoint, like, that's deeply frustrating, right? That's, that's like, that's deeply dissatisfactory. And so I think there's a voracious appetite for vengeance and for um, rectitude, for, for being compensated for the loss of time, that just breeds a desire to sacrifice other people's time, right? To, to slaughter new innocents in order to try to get back what has been lost. And so I, I, I think, I slipped in an ultimately somewhere in there, right? I think left to themselves over the course of uh, 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 millennia, other systems that don't offer an infinite satisfaction, a full satisfaction for wrongdoing, will in fact lead to new sacrifices. Those may be animal sacrifices, right? We may take some real innocence, namely animals, and slaughter them. They did nothing. They're fine. They're not a part of our community, right? But it may also take the form of warfare, right? Oh, those people are outside there. Like, we're going to slaughter all those other people out of a sort of desire to bring rectitude or peace to our own community, right? And so this, I, I think that there's a violence that breeds violence that only the atonement can put an end to. And the principle of the presumption of innocence in American case law, I think, is a you know, several iterations down. There are lots of steps between this, so it's not like they just read the gospel and inferred this, but I think it's a part of the inheritance of uh, Western civilization, if we can use that term, uh, and the uh, leavening of the gospel into the history of America. Um, so I think that's, that's partly why I think that. Yeah, Paul, tell me why I'm wrong. No, no, no. <laughs> I actually want, even though it seems like justice. Even though it seems like justice, that's right. I think that's exactly right. Um, it's woefully incomplete. Justice on its own is woefully incomplete, and it causes harm when it's left on its own. Like it just, it can't do the good that it promises. It cannot deliver salvation. Um, it can't heal. It cannot heal the wounds that it claims to heal. It can only, it can only compensate for those wounds by depriving the wrongdoer of what they inflicted on their victim, and then right? That's collateral too, isn't it? Yeah, the lex talionis, right? I, I will. I mean, spoiler alert: the the lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is a principle of mercy, 
right? It limits what justice supplies to what the wrongdoer does because really, really, there's a desire for more than that within the victim's cry, right? Um, I mean, you don't have to come now because I just said that. Um, so there you are. Uh, one more question, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, go. Um, yeah, to what extent can the church uh, accompany the pagan? And so there's two questions here, right? One is the epistemic question. How does the church decide which versions of justice that are being promulgated on the world it can support and endorse? And then the second one, how does the church decide who to accompany in uh, that work? Um, I think the church has to be open to the claims of justice from wherever they like, are raised, right? And should listen to um, the accounts of justice on offer out in the world. Um, I don't think that the authority of the church to determine, say, the shape of justice means that it knows everything about the universe. I think the church can learn, for instance. Um, within that, I do think that the principal uh, means by which the church makes these determinations is the Bible. Uh, I think the church has to read the text and read the text in such a way that it's alive to the uh, differences between the world of the Old and New Testaments and our own, um, but that also is alive to the similarities between those worlds, worlds uh, that God made those people as he made us. So when the church listens to accounts of justice out in the world, I think it has to do so in a way that really listens, but also listens critically. Um, and listens in such a way that it has a no to certain bad views that it's willing to say. Um, now which no it issues might depend on what matters we're talking about. There might be certain things in scripture, morally, that are clearer than others. I think the case for marriage in scripture uh, between a man and a woman is indisputable. I think it's just written everywhere into the text. Um, and the only way to make a case for gay marriage is to do violence to the word of God. Um, I'm not sure I think that about certain taxation policies, right? In fact, I am quite sure I don't think that about uh, certain taxation policies. The derivation from market, you know, sort of Old Testament understandings of economies to contemporary economies is much more complicated, I think, than it is from what the scripture says about male and female in marriage and contemporary arrangements, right? I think the derivation there is very different. And so within the church's uh, listening to accounts of justice, it has to be alive to the differentiated world of scripture and understand the nature of certain priorities, right? And there are ways in which we can talk about how I would do that and what I think would be right, but I think that's what its responsibility is. Um, who does it accompany? on the way to doing, injust uh, uh, to doing justice. It may, this is, this is hard, the church may accompany some miscreants. There may be some pretty bad characters we, like, who think some things that we would say real hard and fast no to, but who say yes to certain things that we think are really important that uh, uh, we would say, let's go together, you and I. Uh, to pursue this particular social policy. And I think we need to reflect a lot more on the limits uh, and the possibilities of compromise and complicity in our actions with others. Um, I think that's a major area for further reflection by Christians today. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. 
Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.